heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 283, covering the week of October 11th through October 15th, 2021. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to Follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. Our YouTube page is great because it has all of our lectures, our podcasts, all of our Abbeville U videos. It's a fantastic resource and something that, again, is free of charge. In fact, everything we do, this podcast, our website, uh, all the stuff we put out there, the, the videos, all of that is free to you. Our lectures, we've got... Uh, well over 200 lectures available free of charge. All of that is free. Our app, you can download our app off our website, abbevilleinstitute.org. While you're there, give us that email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. You'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday. And uh, it's a great way for us to keep in touch with you and let you know what we're doing. But as I was saying, it's all free. It all exists because you donate to the Institute. So all the things we do that you enjoy with the Institute do cost money. And so if you like what we do, we're getting at the end of the year. A lot of people make tax plans by the time they get to October, November, December. So keep us in mind. We're going to be sending out some correspondence. We're a nonprofit organization. You're going to get some requests for money from us. And look, donate what you can. We're not asking for you to break the bank for us, but you can donate monthly. You can give us 5 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. Is the Southern tradition worth it? Is keeping material like this and keeping these things going worth it? Because if we don't have the revenue to do it, we can't keep these things going. So is that worth it to you to donate $10 a month on a recurring donation or even $100 a year or $50 a year or whatever you can give? We're not asking you to go out and give us $10,000 a year, but if you want to do that, that would be fantastic too. We have all kinds of things we'd love to do, but we don't have the financial resources of, say, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center or the or the Heritage Foundation. If you want to have a left and right organization, we don't have that. Or even Hillsdale College or the Claremont Institute, we don't have their resources. So we're much more limited in our reach because we just don't have the cash. We'd love to. We'd love to do more. We want to make the Southern tradition much more accessible to people. And we get people from all over the world listening to this. So... Uh, and, and reading our website and our material. So we, we'd we enjoy your help in exploring what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Also, click on the shop tab at abbevilleinstitute.org. You can get our logo and all kinds of cool stuff. There's lots of great ways to support the Institute. Share our podcast around. Share our articles around on social media. We no longer have a Facebook presence. doesn't mean you can't share our articles on Facebook. You can do that all day. We just can't put stuff on Facebook anymore. So... But go to Gab. I mean, go over to Gab and get them there. Uh, you know, join up with Gab. Go somewhere that is not Facebook. A lot of people are getting off Facebook anyways. It's a cesspool. It's censorship. It's everything. So go to somewhere else. Go to Gab and and find Abbeville Institute there. All right. Well, let's talk about the material for the week. We had lots of good stuff, um, and. A lot of this stuff this week was, were, they were older articles. In fact, four of the articles were published somewhere else. Now, we do this every now and then. We publish material that's been published somewhere else before because we go to principles. And when you look at the authors that we published, the first article of the week by Phil Lee, I mean, actually, it was published on his email list, and it was just good because he's asking the question, who are Confederate monument uh, the critics really targeting, and they're not targeting Confederate, they're not really just targeting the South, they're targeting you. You see, because to them, it's about the memory. They don't want you to remember, they want you to remember the, the America the way they remember it. This is a war over memory. And they're saying that their memory of America is more accurate than your memory of America, and because of that, your statues, your monuments, your remembrances should be eliminated. Because your memory of America is remembering Awful people, slave owners, racists. That's all the South is to them. This is what Eugene Genovese pointed out. This caricature of the South, this very cartoonish, stupid evaluation of the South, is just that. It's all about race and slavery. It's nothing else. Southerners woke up every day thinking about how they could beat the slaves and how they could be mean to, to black people. That was it. That's what they thought on a regular basis. There's nothing else in the South. Nothing else produced. The South contributed nothing but that to the American story. 
Of course, we all know that's not true. We all know that's a stupid characterization of the South. This is what people think. And so what can the Southern tradition offer? This is something we've been doing for a long time at the Institute. We, we started in 2002. We're almost at the 20th anniversary of the, of the Institute. We've been doing this podcast since 2015. So we've been doing this for a while. And uh, we rebooted our website in 2014. So we, for the last six, seven years, we've really been trying to be much more active in promoting this alternative view of the Southern tradition, this positive view, positive view of the Southern tradition. That's what it is. It's a positive view of the Southern tradition. And so Confederate monument critics, there, there was a Georgia legislature, and Philly points this out, that said, look, I would rather leave up Confederate monuments and put a monument up to Clarence Thomas. Now, this legislator was black. She's saying, I'd rather have Confederate monuments up than put up a monument to a black conservative. Because you see, at the end of the day, what it's really about, it's not about monuments. It's not about race or anything. It's about how they want to remember the past and what power they can have over you. It's about power. It's about control of the narrative. It's about control of memory. These are soft totalitarians. And taking down monuments is one way they can control the narrative. Because you erase that, you erase that defiance, you erase that part of American history, then you create an environment where they win all the time. We are a problem for them because we will not capitulate. We're going to promote a positive view of the South, what the South really offered, what the South really was what the Southern tradition really offers America now. And again, I've said before on this podcast many times, there are parts of the Southern tradition you don't want. There are parts of Southern history that are not good. There is no tradition, no society that can escape that. But when we teach Greek history, do we focus on the fact that most Greek city-states, in fact, all Greek city-states were slaveholding city-states? When we talk about Aristotle, do we talk about the fact that the book of Politics is full of references to slavery? No. When we talk about Rome, do we talk about the brutal situation for Roman slaves? No, we don't. I mean, mention it. You go over it, maybe talk about it a little bit, but you focus on everything else with Roman society. That's one part of it. So why is it when we talk about the South, all we can talk about is slavery and race? Why is that? Well, because it offers an alternative to America that conflicts with what the establishment wants to do, and in fact is the real America. The South was America. The South is America. This Jeffersonian tradition is America. North and South. This is why 60% of the people voted against Abraham Lincoln in 1860, it's why if you look at the entire numbers, if you put them all together in 1864, Lincoln would have lost if the South was voting in the election. He would have lost. Northerners didn't just, this lost cause myth that Northerners run around saying, or now Yankees run around saying, that, that was North and South. They all believed it because it was real. So this is where we need to get into these things. This is why that piece by Philly is important. They're attacking you. They're attacking your traditions, your heritage, your ancestors. And not just that, they're attacking real America. Because Robert E. Lee represented real America. He represented the American, he represented what the founding generation stood for. He did. And when you take that away, and of course to the 1619 people, the founding generation is evil. The founding of America is evil. You see, so you have to take all that away too. And yes, if you're going to be honest about the founding generation, this is where the Claremont people get into trouble because they try to create some kind of myth about the founding. There's things about the founding that do not comport with the way we look at modern society. It doesn't mean that those people are evil. It just means they were different people, people of their own time. But they said a lot of really good things. So much of the week was dedicated to uh, these older pieces and some interesting writers. Tuesday, we had a piece by John Shelton Reed. John Shelton Reed uh, was a professor of sociology at uh, University of North Carolina. He's retired now. But he wrote for Chronicles Magazine, wrote for Southern Partisan for years. 
under a different name, but wrote for Southern Partisan, wrote for Chronicles, wrote a number of books. He's now writing books about barbecue and other things. Great stuff. He's a great writer. In fact, he has a very folksy way about his writing. And right around 1996, he published a book, uh, 1,000 Things You Didn't Know About the South. And this was a primer for it. It was published in Chronicles Magazine in 1995. And so we're talking about a piece that's nearly 30 years old. And uh, it's great. I mean, he brings up all different types of the South, all different parts of the South. It isn't just focused on any one particular group or one particular section. He also talks about some pretty rotten movies that have been made about the South. And that's, we've done that too. We've talked about, you know, cinema, which is how we get our pop culture nowadays, the television, the big screen. We got the small screen, the big screen. The big screen often comes to the small screen. So then, how do we think about the South? And when you look at portrayal of Southerners, they're often seen as stupid, hayseeds, or the bad guys, or the evil people. Not always, but oftentimes. And that's because, again, the South represents this other. It represents this mysterious, exotic place where people do all kinds of bad things. This is what the Northern mind says. I mean, this is this is how they conceptualize of it. It's in their mind. This is their this is their great uh, boogeyman. The South is their great boogeyman. So this piece by John Shelton Reed was great. And then on Wednesday we ran a piece by Sam Francis, Beautiful Losers. Now he wrote a book by that title. This is from 1991, also Chronicles magazine. Sam Francis, of course, has become a pariah. He's dead now. But when you listen to conservatives in the mainstream talk about Sam Francis, most of them are negative. Though there are some people that are starting to begrudgingly acknowledge how smart he actually was and how prescient he actually was when it comes to what America was going to be and what it was going to become and how it was going to go off the rails. And he was predicting it all the way back long before 1991, but I mean, 1991, this piece, Beautiful Losers, again, published in Chronicles Magazine, really shows this, right? I mean, there's there's the establishment of America, and then there's real America. And the problem is, Conservative Inc. represents establishment America, and real America is unrepresented. This is something I talked about on my own podcast this week on Tuesday. I'm sorry, uh, next week I'll talk about on Tuesday. Uh, that the establishment is uh, interested only in itself. And when they talk about Lincoln or Grant, they are, they're trying to come up with a way to win elections. And they think they're going to do it by being 19th century liberals. But in the, in the process, they're losing real America. They're losing real America. And so Sam Francis was pointing this out. There's the corporate class. There's the establishment class. There are these people that simply love the current system and they don't want it to go away. And they'll do everything they can to keep it. Doesn't mean if, doesn't matter if it's left or right. They just love it. They love it. And so we've created that in America. And Sam Francis was on it. I mean, so the issue with Sam Francis, of course, is the things that he said were the, the you know, people like Dinesh D'Souza, called him a racist, and of course he had to resign from the Washington Times and other things, and he became persona non grata. But Rush Limbaugh spent, in 2016, wrote uh, read an essay by Sam Francis and spent almost half his show talking about how important it was, how Sam Francis predicted Donald Trump. He did. So did Pat Buchanan in 1992. I mean, just a year after Francis wrote this essay, Beautiful Losers, Pat Buchanan's up there in 92 with his culture war speech, and uh, they were all predicting this. You see, what they predicted in the 90s has come true by 2021. 2020, 2021, we're in that now. 30 years later, we see it. We see it come to fruition. And so that's why Sam Francis is so important. He is one of the great thinkers of not just the South, but also of America in the 20th century, the post-World War II 20th century. And so when you, when you think about the Southern tradition, you have to include Sam Francis in that. He was good friends with Clyde Wilson. You have to inc include him in that group. And I think that uh, Clyde uh, sent me an email saying that there's going to be a book about Sam Francis coming out. Joe Scotchy is going to produce a book on it, from what I understand, or what he, what he thinks. 
So that's going to be great to have a book on Sam Francis. I don't know when that's coming out or what it's what the exact thrust of the book is going to be, but it would be marvelous to have that, to have a book on Sam Francis. Mel Bradford, uh, you know, we've, there's a, been a book on Mel Bradford, Defender of Southern Conservatism, which Clyde Wilson edited. Uh, it's a great book. You can't get it for, I mean, gosh, I think the copies of that now are selling for like a thousand bucks. Uh, on book selling sites. There weren't that many produced, so it's hard to get. But you've certainly got uh, a wonderful contributor to, to American political thought, but based on the Southern tradition. I mean, Francis is really talking about nothing more than agrarian, the, the agrarians moving forward 60 years after the agrarians. You think about that. Essays published 1991, that's 30 years ago. 30 years from now, we're at the same point as San Francis was from the agrarians, or essentially where the 1960s were from the agrarians. And uh, how much has changed? How much changed in those 30 years? How much I'm sure will change again in 30 years? But how much has changed since San Francis wrote this essay in 1991 and later on the book? And so we just had to put this out there. I mean, people need to read these essays. Maybe you've never been exposed to it before. Maybe you've never seen it before. This is certainly part of the Southern tradition. I know I'm preaching to the choir for a lot of people. I know that a lot of people have read this essay, but maybe you haven't. And so you need to read it and digest it because he, he clearly outlined where we are, where we were in 91 and where we were going and where we've gotten to in 2021. So again, a fantastic essay uh, that you know clearly shows that the Southern tradition could predict where we were going. And then we had a piece uh, that was published actually in 1916, An Economic Interpretation of American History by William Dodd, who was a great Southern historian. William Dodd was very good. And this particular piece gets into a review of Charles Beard's work. Now, Charles Beard was, more importantly, a progressive historian. But he wrote uh, an interesting book on the Constitution titled An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution. And that book set the stage for a very interesting discussion of Constitution, the founding of the, of the United States and American constitutionalism. Um that led to Forrest McDonald hitting his home run. And McDonald was critical of Beard, but then later on wrote an introduction to Beard to a, re to a, a new edition of Beard's book and basically came back around and said Beard was right about some things. This led to what's called soft and hard interpretations of the American founding. The soft interpretation would be ideological. The hard would be economic. You would have court and country, essentially. It was this idea that you had... The court interpretation, which was Beard, and then you had the country interpretation, which would be like McDonald and Bernard Balin, who wrote these ideological origins of the American founding. And essentially what, what, what we've gotten out of that is a consensus. There were certainly ideological parts of this. There were also practical parts to it. There were people that could make money with the Constitution. That was certainly part of the founding process founding period, people thinking about that, how they could make money on it. There were interested parties that could make money if we ratified the Constitution and created a central banking system. That would be the Hamiltonians. But when you go back and look at it, I don't think that there's any question that what they were talking about more than anything else was power. And that was the real debate. What kind of power would this central authority have? And would it be controlled by the states or not? They certainly wanted to kill uh, paper money. That was part of it. I mean, there were, there were those things said about it. But Beard was interested in his book on American civilization, which he wrote later. We need, to, we need to take Beard seriously because he pointed out the Jeffersonians and Hamiltonians. He was on to that long before other historians, really, and particularly now that we're talking about this in American conservatism. He was on to it then. Now, Beard was a progressive. Beard was a leftist. But he was a good historian. He and his wife wrote good histories. 
And I think that's what's missing in American, the American historical profession now. These kind of sweeping histories that are good, that take into account all these things. And Beard understood ideology. He also understood tradition. He understood these things. So when you look at this piece by Dodd and he goes through it, he goes through this economic, the economic interpretation of American history. The reason we publish this is because uh, Dodd gets into the Jeffersonian position. In fact, Dodd says this. Again, modern historians have been misled by the fact that Lincoln worked out his salvation of the Union by constant appeals to the Constitution, as though that document was not on the side of the property-holding interests of the South. But Lincoln knew perfectly well that the only way to win was to arouse the devotions of the plain people to an ideal Constitution and thus unite men who cared for property with those who had too little wealth to understand the interest of property. But since Lincoln was a Democrat, insofar as it ever has been possible for a president of the United States to be Democratic, we have confused democracy with constitutionalism. The fact is that between constitutionalism and democracy, there is a great gulf fixed which cannot be bridged. He who appeals to constituent constitutions, I'm sorry, court decisions and static law is consciously or unconsciously an opponent of democracy. He is afraid of the people, of the mob, as he is likely to say. Now, this is interesting because, of course, the Jeffersonians would not appeal to court decisions, but they would appeal to constitutions and static law. Beard is looking at this very class-oriented, and I think Dodd is kind of bought into that a little bit. But when you read this piece, um, you get an understanding that there is a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here, and there's a lot going on in this very hard interpretation of American history. Not a soft interpretation, but a hard interpretation of American history. And so historians have been talking about this stuff for a very long time. And I remember when I was in graduate school and I was critical of Beard at one point, Clyde Wilson stopped me and said, well, it's not the economic interpretation of the Constitution. It's an economic interpretation of the Constitution. And when you look at what Dodd says, he says, it is this condition or circumstances which, make it, which makes history the most difficult as well as the most interesting of all studies, and which makes the verdicts of the distinctively economic or political historians sometimes very doubtful. But Mr. Beard does not claim that his work is final. Indeed, he openly avows that it is only fragmentary, that it is incomplete. You see, it's an economic interpretation. It's not the final word. It's not the interpretation. It's an economic interpretation. That's important because he's not saying this is it, that there's not something else. And I think that's where uh, Forrest McDonald fit, fits with Beard because it wasn't just about Beard. There was more to this, and Beard knew it. Beard knew it. So then we wrapped up the week with another piece from 1896, The Father of Representative Government in America. And... One thing I'll just give you an insight to what we're doing, and it's we're going to be calling for perhaps some financial support for this. We're looking at creating something called the 1607 Project, and um, it's going to be a look at Virginia, and it's going, to, it's going to start with Virginia first. Now, the 1619 Project essentially starts with Virginia first. It starts with 1619 as being the founding of America because that's when slaves arrived. But there's more to 1619 than slaves arriving in Virginia. In fact, this piece, The Father of Representative Government in America by William Robertson Garrett, published in 1896, has this line. On the 30th day of July, 1619, the first legislative assembly in America convened at Jamestown, Virginia. That is the real significance of 1619. It's also, by incidentally, the, day, the year that we had our first... Uh, Thanksgiving, where it was supposed to be an annual tradition in North America. This predated the pilgrims by a couple of years. So 1619 is important, but it's important because we had our first legislative government in America. And that's why this piece is so good. Now, it's long. It's a long piece. And he goes into a substantial detail about what's happening in Virginia at this particular point. 
But the fact that we had self-government in Virginia in 1619, and you look at the people that were involved in that, the names that were involved in that. He says, on the 30th day of July, 1619, the Burgesses assembled at Jamestown and representative government in America was an accomplished fact. Representative government in America was an accomplished fact. That is the significance of 1619. We had representative government. And uh, he quotes from uh, another book by William Root Henry, who uh, talks about who these people were. He says, let us glance at the counselors who sat on either side of Governor Yardley. They were all Englishmen of high type, and following ancient customs, they sat with their hats on. Among them was Sir Francis West, the son of Sir Thomas West, the second Lord Delaware. He was subsequently to become governor of Virginia. He was a direct descendant of William the Conqueror. Captain Nathaniel Powell had come to Virginia with the first colonists. He had been with Newport when he explored York River and with Smith when he explored Chesapeake Bay. He was a man of culture and kept an account of occurrences in the colony, which had been freely used by Captain Smith in his history of Virginia. John Rolfe had come to Virginia with Sir Thomas Gates in 1612. He introduced the systemic culture of tobacco in Virginia. In 1614, he had married the Princess Pocahontas, whom he carried to England in 1616. The Reverend William Wickham was of a prominent family. He added the dignity of the clergy to the assembly in which he sat. Captain Samuel May Maycock was a Cambridge scholar and a gentleman of birth, virtue, and industry. John Pory, secretary of the colony, sat as speaker of the Burgesses. He had been educated at Cambridge and was an accomplished scholar. He was a discipline, I'm sorry, disciple, excuse me, of the celebrated Hacklet who left the highest testimonials to his learning. Having served in Parliament, he was able to give order to their proceedings in proper form to their acts. The Reverend Richard Buck, the officiating minister, was educated at Oxford and was an able and learned divine. He married in Virginia, was the minister at Jamestown, where in, where in 1614 he performed the marriage ceremony between Rolf and the Indian Princess Pocahontas. The church in which the assembly met had been built for him, wholly at the charge of the inhabitants of James City. Think about that. I mean, look at these people, where they come from. These are accomplished men. These are not just ragtag nobodies who showed up in Virginia. These were the distressed cavaliers. These were the men who came from families that had built not just Virginia, but also England in many ways. So when you look at these first gentlemen of Virginia, you look at who these men were. It's, it's almost heresy to say that they were just some a bunch of ragtag slave owners and that was the founding of Virginia. It was just a bunch of evil guys out there who wanted to have slaves. It's, it ignores what the South and what Southern history really is. So this is why 1619 is so important and why we need to think about it moving forward and have a real discussion about the importance of Virginia in American life. It's not just... Uh, it's not just slavery, as the left would like to say, but there's so much more here. And it's not just the founding of 1607. I mean, that, that was the founding of the South, 1607. It wasn't just how the London Company sold Virginia. It wasn't just Captain John Smith. It was all these other people that made Virginia so important. Virginia, as Calhoun said at one point, if Virginia would just lead, we'd all be okay. We need Virginia to lead. And... Virginia today can't lead because it's run by a bunch of lunatics. But the Virginia tradition could still lead. We could still rely on Jefferson. We could still rely on Madison and Monroe and Mason and Washington. We could still rely on that tradition to lead. And in that way, we could move forward with the Southern tradition. Until next time, good day. Good day.